So the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia was one of the first people, uh, groups involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. So we, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and, it, and it's the way that, of course, Oliver North, William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country, and many connections between the two. This SNL that, that Benson bought after he got out of Jefferson, uh, became Continental Savings, and that purchase was financed by Herman K. Beebe. So it's possible that mafia money went to Lloyd Benson. A subject that has been ignored by the establishment media. Pete Bruton has written a book about it, and we talk with him right now on Alternative Views. Today, Alternative Views will interview Pete Bruton concerning his book, The Mafia, CIA, and George Bush. Pete is a former Houston Post reporter who broke the story of the connections between the SNL scandal and the CIA, exposing how CIA assets would borrow money from the SNLs to finance off-the-book operations and then declare bankruptcy and leave U.S. taxpayers with the bill. Well, for the past five years, Pete has been tracking down who actually profited from the SNL scam, who the main players were, and how they skimmed off their money. Lo and behold, Pete discovered that the beneficiaries of the SNL scandals were friends of George Bush and his family, unsavory folks connected to the CIA and mafia, as well as associates of Texas big shots such as Senator Lloyd Benson and Houston power broker Walter Mischer. Well, obviously, this is an explosive story, and today we are going to explore the full ramifications of the SNL crisis with author Pete Bruton, who's now a law student here at the University of Texas. Pete, this is such an incredible story, one that is so complex, it seems to me almost one impossible to tell, but you do it so well in your book. Uh, before we get into the intricacies of it, I wonder if you can tell us uh, how George Bush himself was involved in this. His family was, but was he himself involved much? Bush's role was on many levels. First of all, as vice president during the Reagan-Bush years, he was the head of the Reagan-Bush deregulation efforts across the board, and that included savings and loans. And the deregulation of savings and loans that occurred primarily in 1982 with the uh, St. Germain Garn bill um, basically opened up savings and loans to the crooks. Uh, SNLs had traditionally just done home mortgage lending uh, to middle class Americans and they succeeded very well for 50 years. Uh, they had some problems then in the late 70s and early 80s with the inflation, so the Bush, Reagan Bush administration and Congress decided that they were going to deregulate, quote unquote, savings and loans. And this allowed SNLs to basically invest their money and lend their money on anything they wanted to and was an open invitation to the criminal element. And sure enough, the mafia 
was one of the first people, uh, groups involved in looting SNLs in the early 80s. And the deregulation that Bush was in charge of did that. Uh, Bush also, as vice president, either he or his top aides intervened in the federal regulation of the biggest failed savings loan in the country at that time, Sunrise Savings in Boynton Beach, Florida. The CEO of Sunrise went up to Bush's office when he was vice president, and the, the story varies. He tells one story one time and one story another. He either met with Bush, with Bush's top aides, including C. Boyd and Gray, who is the current White House counsel. Uh, and he asked them to get the federal regulators off his back. They were trying to stop Sunrise from basically throwing their assets away. And uh, one week after he met with these people, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board that regulates savings and loans withdrew a very stringent cease and desist order against Sunrise and replaced it with a weak supervisory agreement. And a congressional study found that this move cost taxpayers possibly $100 million or more in keeping Sunrise open. Sunrise was then closed down a year later, a year and a half later, uh, at a cost of the federal taxpayers of $700 million. And there was no Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation. It was just shut down. Uh, we find if you look at the major borrowers at Sunrise, you find mafia people, you find CIA people, and you find a Houston businessman named John Riddle, who ties into the circle of Houston businessmen that George Bush comes from. And Riddle, at this time, was involved in the transshipment of arms to the Middle East. Now, the top number two official at the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and Fairbanks was in this meeting with the Sunrise CEO when he was asking them to get the feds off his back. Her husband, Richard Fairbanks was in charge at that time of the State Department's efforts to keep arms from Iran called Operation Staunch. He quit a year later and became the Washington lawyer and lobbyist for Iraq and worked with Iraq until <laughs> Iraq invaded <laughs> Kuwait. Now it's interesting also to note that the largest failed SNL in the country that did not have a Federal Home Loan Bank Board investigation, Sunrise was number two largest. The largest was Hill Financial in Red Hill, Pennsylvania that plays a big part in my book. And the number two borrower at Hill Financial was John Riddle's buddy, a Houston builder named Mike Atkinson, who at that time was transshipping arms to the Middle East. So you find a connecting thread here of arms to the Middle East and savings and loans. And, and Bush's office was directly involved in keeping the Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Savings open and was lending money to John Riddle. It seems like uh, such a, a complex thing, but it seems everywhere you look, there are certain things going on. The CIA and the mafia, and uh, there were drugs that were being run back uh, into the United States. There were illegal arms being uh, procured and sent to uh, the Contras as well as to Iran. And Iraq, as we and, now know. And Iraq. Uh, but all of these interests coincided, the mafia, the, uh, now, how did the mafia, was the mafia just after money? Is that how, and, uh, and uh, perhaps the selling of drugs when they came back into the United States? I think the mafia just found it as another, you know, trough they could feed at. And I think they were in on it at the beginning when they saw, they knew what deregulation was going to do. And the fact that they, they figured out a scheme, and, and the head of this scheme was a New York mobster named Mario Renda, mm -hmm. who went to jail for like, less than three years. Uh, he was convicted in New York, Florida, and Kansas City. Uh, Renda would collect money from various institutions like pension funds and credit unions, bundle it up into $100,000 bundles so it was covered by federal deposit insurance, and then place it in savings and loans all across the country, billions of dollars. And once he got the money, the deposits into an SNL, he could basically control them. He, could, he had a hammer over their head if they didn't do with this money what he wanted to, he'd just pull it out. And this was called linked financing. He would place the deposits and then tell the SNLs to loan the money, to lend the money to his buddies. They would then just rip it off, take it and, and, and rip it off. Now, in Texas, we found a, a Louisiana mobster named Herman K. Beebe, yeah. who was controlling SNLs in a different way than Renda. And we found Beebe and Renda together in many, many different places across the country.
many connections between the two. But Beebe would actually finance the purchase of savings and loans by his associates like Don Dixon at Vernon, Carol Kelly at Continental, uh, Jarrett Woods at Western, Roy Daly at First Savings of East Texas. And then he would have a hammer over their head where he was holding the note on their stock to the SNL so they would do what he wanted to. I think it's so significant what you've pointed out that this isn't just something, the, these relationships aren't something which came together suddenly when they said, oh, hey, here's a great big uh, pig, let's cut it up. There were, this was just a continuation of relationships between powerful people uh, at various levels, uh, state, local, and national, that have been going on for some time. Well, that, that's correct. In fact, we had a sort of dry run on the SNL scandal in the mid-70s in Texas with the so-called Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal, where we have the same people that showed up in the SNL crisis ripping off small Texas banks and doing the same thing, trading bad loans between each other, uh, trading co capital stock loans between each other. And uh, Herman K. Beebe was in the middle of that. Uh, ben Barnes, his, his uh, business partner, was in the middle of it. And then later, Ben Barnes and John Conley show up as big, big borrowers at many of the dirtiest SNLs in the country. Uh, George Alban, another uh, guy that was involved in savings and loans, uh, was in the Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal. So, and, and the federal government knew about the Rent-A-Bank scandal. They came in and, and did an investigation. Uh, there was a savings and loan in Texas and Houston called Surety that a woman named Rosemary Stewart was in charge of, of the federal regulation of in Washington. And she saw Herman K. B. she saw Walter Misher, she saw Misher's son-in-law, Robert Corson. And when these people all got back in the SNLs, you know, five, 10 years later, she did nothing. And she was then in charge of the Office of Enforcement of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. Pete, yeah, your book begins, in fact, by discussing Walter Misher, who is a Houston banker and power broker, as a major player in this whole SNL scam. Can you tell a little bit about him and what role he actually played in this scenario? Yeah, Walter Misher um, was at the very center of the Houston business connections that, that all, you, you take all these SNLs and you start tracking back where the money goes and you find Misher and his friends. Misher was what we call a hyphenated Texan, banker hyphenated <laughs> developer. And there's probably a few other hyphens in there too, uh, political power broker. Um, he controlled politicians on all levels. Um, Misher basically told the Houston developers who they were going to donate political campaign, uh, campaign money to. Um, Misher had the third largest bank in Houston, Allied Bank, and he used Allied Bank to finance many different things, including some of the dirtiest savings and loans in Houston, like Continental Savings, uh, Mainland Savings, uh, and some others. And in fact, Misher knew that the SNLs were going down the tubes in the early 80s because he sold a savings and loan he had, Ben Franklin Savings, that at one time had belonged to Lloyd Benson's company. Uh, he also ordered all the SNL capital stock loans out of, of Allied uh, in 82-83 so that when these SNLs failed, he wouldn't be caught holding the bag. And in turn, he had many savings and loans helping he and his bank out indirectly. In one kind, Mainland Savings in Houston bought a $20 million loan that Allied held on an oil company it was in bankruptcy. And a later investigation showed that Mainland lost at least $14 million on this. There was no hope of repaying, and Mainland just did it as a favor to Allied. The CEO of, of Mainland had had his Mainland stock financed at Allied Bank and was a good friend of Walter Misher. And, and what sort of political friends did Walter Misher have? Who were his main sort of political connections? Well, Misher goes back to the old 8F days of the Lamar Hotel in Houston where the Brown brothers, uh, Jesse Jones, Gus Wortham, these people were wheeling and dealing, controlling Houston and, and politicians like Lyndon Johnson. It goes back that far. And then you bring uh, uh, Misher, was very close to John Conley, Ben Barnes, uh, Lloyd Benson, and George Bush. And uh, most of the Houston mayors and Harris County judges um, almost all of the Texas governors, except for Ann Richards, I'm not sure about her, but we know uh, Dolph Briscoe and, and uh, even uh, Republicans like Bill Clements 
uh, Misher was very close to and supported. And Misher's political donations and influence went to both parties. It was not just Democrats. I mean, he, he supported Democrats, of course, back in the 50s and 60s when Democrats controlled this state, but he also, you know, controlled and, and helped a lot of, of Republicans like John Tower and, uh, and George Bush and Bill Clinton. So he was a well-connected uh, fellow. Very well connected, and, and not just, of course, the politicians. I mean, he was connected to the mafia, well, that's which was a big shock. I mean, when, when uh, I was reporting the Houston Post, and people started telling me about his connections to the mafia, and uh, we did a big interview with him, and it was on the cover of the Houston Post Sunny Magazine. And uh, I asked him, what about all the rumors about your connections to Carlos Marcello, the New Orleans mafia boss? And he admitted that he had sat down to do business with Marcello. At one time, Marcello had come in and wanted to buy a couple of his hotels, including the Carousel Hotel on the South Loop. And he said he did not sell them to him because he did not want to get, quote, run out of town. Well, it turns out <laughs> when you investigate who he really sold it to, it turns out to be a, a Marcello frontman and associate. So he really did, and, and Misher and his partners kept the deed, the title, to this hotel while Marcello's front man was showing the X-rated movies and running prostitutes in this hotel. And what about uh, H.K. Beebe, his connections with Walter Misher and the uh, mob? Yeah, well, well Beebe, the, New Orleans, uh, the Louisiana Mafia associate from Shreveport, um, had turned up first in the Texas rent bank scandal where he was connected to Ben Barnes, who of course was in Walter Misher's hip pocket. Um, Beebe then uh, was borrowing money from Misher's allied bank. Uh, Misher was supporting him, they were making him uh, operating loans, uh, giving him insurance business, and in one case, uh, uh, the stock of Continental Savings in Houston was financed at Misher's allied bank with a guarantee from Herman K. Beebe. So they were very close in doing business, not only in the Tex Houston area, but in Louisiana. We find associates of Misher, very close associates, including the former controller of the currency, Robert Clark, going in and buying a bank with Herman K. Beebe in Louisiana, along with two, the two top executives at Misher's bank. Now, was he, uh, was Beebe uh, under Marcello? Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. And this had been determined actually by the Texas Attorney General's Organized Crime Strike Force in the mid-70s. Uh, John Hill has actually had an organized crime investigative unit uh, headed by, I believe, Tim James. And they found the connections between uh, Herman K. Beebe and Carlos Marcello. Uh, Beebe was also tied to Marcello by the New Orleans Metropolitan Crime Commission. This is back in the mid-70s, and then you find all of the connections then later with the SNL scandal. Can you give us an example of how the mafia comes in with the mob, uh, loots, a uh, savings and loan or two, and then move on? Well, they would, uh, in Beebe's case, he would actually finance the, the controlling stock of an SNL, and then the loans would be made to either Beebe or his associates, and then they would take the money and walk the loans, and uh, leaving the SNL with property that wasn't worth any what, matter what they'd lent on it. And that's the way they'd basically fail. How did the CIA get involved then with these people? Well, that, that's a good question. I, I don't think we know the final answer yet. Um, there are some people that believe that William Casey had been in on the beginning of the deregulation and knew that it was susceptible. You know, Casey was an old Wall Street lawyer and head of the SEC at one time and knew that the, the SNLs were very vulnerable to being looted and the money taken out and, and never found. Uh, but on the other hand, we have people like Walter Misher uh, who are connected to the CIA can probably see that if they keep the CIA happy, you know, diverting some of the money to CIA operations, then, you know, they will get what the FBI calls the CIA's get out of jail free card. In other words, if they're working, doing, and helping the CIA and they get caught, then the CIA can come in and say, don't prosecute this person. Uh, he's working with us. And that happened on a number of occasions in the SNL crisis, where we would have a, a, a savings and loan looter or a bank looter getting caught by the FBI and the Justice Department and the CIA trying to get them off the hook.
because they work with them. Now, we've had on Alternative Views, those of you who have been watching Alternative Views regularly know that about the uh, drug scams which were going on where illegal arms would be shipped down to the Contras particularly and the C-130s would be filled up with uh, cocaine and all and brought back in the United States and offloaded, sometimes at U.S. Um, Air Force bases, sometimes at uh, uh, more covert landing strips. Uh, now. How would this operation fit in with what we're talking about? Right. Uh, we found a number of people in Florida that were helping the Contras, taking weapons, guns for drugs, that were involved in failed banks and savings and loans. Um, one CIA gun and drug runner was a guy named Jack DeVoe. And DeVoe was actually bringing in his cocaine into the Ocean Reef Club on Key Largo that was owned by Carl Linder the Cincinnati uh, businessman. Oh, and he's very uh, close to Bush. Very close to Bush. Okay, Bush would go down and actually vacation at the Ocean Reef Club. And there's a picture in my book of Bush and a fishing boat off Ocean Reef. And this is where Jack DeVoe was bringing in his cocaine. And DeVoe was also taking guns down to Latin America for the CIA. Now, DeVoe's money launderer was a Miami attorney named Lawrence Freeman. Freeman had previously worked for Paul Hellowell, one of the founding fathers of the CIA, and also was laundering money for Santo Traficante, the Tampa, Florida uh, mafia boss. Freeman drew up the documents, the sales contract for a 21,000 acre land deal in the Florida Panhandle that Hill Financial Savings, the one in Pennsylvania we previously talked about, and Vision Bank Savings in Kingsville, Texas, that was owned by Walter Mischer's former son-in-law, financed. And here we have Lawrence Freeman uh, drawing up the papers and involved with these people. And he's you know, closely connected to the CIA. He had been the in-house counsel for Castle Bank and Trust in Nassau, uh, a bank that was used by the mafia and the CIA to hide and launder money and was shut down when Paul Hellowell died. And it appeared that many of these, these offshore money laundering operations were moved after Castle Bank failed and, and was shut down to the Isle of Jersey. And Lawrence Freeman was laundering Jack DeVoe's drug money through the Isle of Jersey. Uh, Robert Corson, uh, Mishra's former son-in-law, and Mike Atkinson were laundering s &L money through the Isle of Jersey, along with some people in Colorado that connect to Neil Bush. All were using the same, the same trust, the same trust on the Isle of Jersey were getting drug money and s &L money, and they were mixed in in the same bank accounts. Um, Pete, could you give some examples of how the CIA would loot SNLs and what they'd use the money for? Well, it, it's not like the CIA would you'd, you'd get a loan from an SNL and, <laughs> and, and down the bottom line, you know, for guns, guns to uh, the Contras. Signed by the CIA. Right. right. Uh, that's not the way they operate. I mean, they use cutouts and front people so that to maintain their plausible deniability so that they can come in and deny that it wasn't them. And what's a cutout then? A cutout is a front man, a middle person, who may not even know he's working for the CIA. Mm. Uh, he could, there could be four or five levels of, of cutouts and front men, the, the layers that the CIA, would, the money would flow through so that it couldn't be tracked back to the CIA. Um, one of the best examples we have in the SNLs was when Mainland Savings, this is the SNL that Walter Mischer was financing the stock of, this is the SNL whose, whose chairman of the board, Raymond Hill, was a close and longtime friend of James A. Baker III, White House Chief of Staff, former Treasury Secretary, former Secretary of State, George Bush's best friend. Uh, when Mainland failed, James Baker's old law firm, Andrews and Kurth in Houston, was brought in by the feds to investigate the failure and file a lawsuit against the officers and directors to try to recover the lost money. Andrews and Kurth investigated actually drew up a lawsuit, a petition, but was never filed. It was stopped at the top layers of Andrews Kurt and the federal government. And as a result, no lawsuit was ever filed against Raymond Hill, the, the, the mainland CEO, and no money was ever recovered. Uh, no indictments have ever been filed against anybody in the failure of mainland savings. Okay, so here we have this SNL. It's wired in to Walter Mischer and James Baker. Uh, in the summer of 1985, James Baker went before a Senate Finance Committee as Treasury Secretary and told them that there was nothing to worry about 
in the SNLs. Everything was wonderful and fine <laughs> and nothing bad was going to happen. At the very same time, Mainland Savings was entering into a $68 million land deal with Adnan Khashoggi, a oh. Saudi Arabian middleman yeah. and arms dealer. And uh, it was a very complicated deal. The result of it was that Khashoggi walked away with about $16 million in cash profit, pure profit from this land deal. Uh, the taxpayers later got stuck with about a $50 million loss on this deal. This was closed. This deal was closed and the money transferred on August the 1st, 1985. Six days later, Adnan Khashoggi begins the transfer of $5 million to Gobanifar, the Iranian middleman, to start the first publicized arms for hostages deal. It's interesting that he transferred $5 million to Gobanifar because at the same time, Mainland was basically giving him $16 million. They also gave him a $5 million letter of credit that was very strange because it could only be drawn on in the first week in November of 85. And it had all the earmarks of a guarantee. And in fact, later when Khashoggi's people were trying to cover this up from the FBI, who, who caught on to this pretty soon, uh, they said it was a, to guarantee uh, some stock that Khashoggi had bought from Mainland. But the money to buy that stock had come from Mainland in this deal. In other words, Mainland gave Khashoggi $10 million he gives it back to them in exchange for $10 million in stock. And they said, oh, by the way, here's a letter of credit for $5 million to guarantee this stock. It didn't make any sense at all because it came from mainland. The money came from mainland, but the $5 million matches exactly the $5 million that Khashoggi paid Gabbana for. So, Pete, this is, in a sense, the beginning of Iran-Contra yes. that's funded with SNL money. So one Ultimately. of the reasons why Baker and Bush and the U.S. government was not regulating the SNLs, was not doing something about this crisis that was emerging, is because they were using the SNLs to finance some of their off-the-book activities they didn't want Congress or the public to look into. I think, Is that a correct? Point? I think that's ultimately what happened. Now, whether we can prove that they, quote, used them, uh, you know, we'll probably never know, but that is the ultimate upshot of what happened. And the money, of course, from mainland ultimately came from the American taxpayers. So we, in a sense, were financing these covert illegal operations. Uh, and, it, and it's the way that, of course, Oliver North and William Casey, it's the way that George Bush, the way they like to do things. I mean, North testified before Congress that what William Casey was looking for and trying to set up was a self-sustaining, off-the-shelf, self-financing covert operation. And here we had it. Uh, we see it in operation with the savings and loan money that ultimately came from the American taxpayers. So, you know, Khashoggi wasn't out any money. Uh, the Iranians and Israelis really weren't out. It came from the American taxpayers. Incredible. Now, in the, so much of what we've talked about previously in alternative views and in a lot of the news stories that you would read, they would mainly focus on the savings and loans themselves and all these wheelers and dealers like Don Dixon up in Vernon Savings or Charles Keating and all of that. But we're talking about a stratum above that those people, aren't we? Oh, definitely. I think Dixon and Keating and, and all the others, Ed McBurney, Jarrett Woods, Tyrell Barker, were just front men. I mean, they were cutouts, basically. And if you look at how much money they got, I call them one or two percenters. Uh, Dixon got maybe, what, $20 million out of Vernon? I mean, he himself. And Vernon is costing taxpayers over $1 billion. Keating got about $40 million. And Lincoln Savings is costing taxpayers two billion dollars. So you can see you're getting one or two percent and, and it's a classic front man setup. And uh, the people that you have to, who's really getting this money and you start scratching and digging, you find that you, you're in another stratum, as you say, of businessmen who are connected to the politicians very strongly. Of course, Keating had strong connections too, but if you look at who got the money out of, out of Lincoln, you find uh, John Conley and Ben Barnes getting close to $100 million. Uh, you find a little bank in Paris called Saudi European. Paris, Texas. Paris, uh, no, actually Paris, France. Paris, France. Yes. Oh. It, it connects into the BCCI. Oh, I see. And uh, Keating was investing money in, in that. Um, and you start scratching and digging, you find uh, 
even bigger players than Keating behind this. So then there was that. Now this layer is the layer of the mafia and the CIA. And uh, was anybody? Was there another layer above them, like the big banks? Uh, they must. They were getting the money, uh, the benefits of the l money laundering from drugs because they would uh, be laundered through the uh, U.S. big banking system. Well, that's correct. Were they also benefiting from this at a, even a, a yes. same level or higher level? Well, the banks and insurance companies, believe it or not, were some of the, the big institutions that got bailed out by the SNLs. If you had a piece of property or an office building, the, the first mortgage or the first lien on it might be held by a big bank or a big insurance company. And when the savings and loan would come in and take out everything and refinance the whole deal, the banks and SNLs would get paid off by the savings and loan. In fact, that happened in the Khashoggi deal. Uh, Texas Commerce Bank had a $15 million a mortgage against Khashoggi's property. And the money to pay off that mortgage came from mainland savings and also Lamar Savings in Austin uh, joined in, in in that. So Texas Commerce Bank got all their money back from the savings and loans. You find it happen time and time again. A piece of property will have a first big first mortgage by a bank or insurance company that will get paid off by the SNL when they take the whole deal out. Well, as I understand the big banks, I mean the Wall Street banks and all, <clears throat> a lot of these deals, a lot of the property would be resold and eventually uh, they would come up into the hands of these bigger banks and insurance companies like in New York. And so I guess they would be the first ones to be paid off in any type of bailout, would they not? Well, sure. I mean, if they're holding the first mortgage, they get, they're get they going to get the money first before anybody. And the savings loan might be holding a third or fourth mortgage. I mean, they would wrap these things and flip these things so that the SNL might be third or fourth in line and would never get, once the property sold uh, and the first mortgage, uh, mortgagee is paid off, the SNL is left with nothing. Pete, there's a chapter of your book called The Mobsters, Spooks, and George Bush, the Palmer National Bank Story that ties all these things that we're talking about together. In other words, the way that high-level officials with connections to the government, corporate and political officials, formed a bank, the Palmer National Bank, and how it became connected with all these unsavory operations. Do you want to give us some detail on this to sort of concretely illustrate this analysis? The Palmer National Bank had just about everybody in it. It was a small bank, still exists in Washington, D.C., about two blocks north of the White House. Uh, it was started by a Louisiana businessman named Harvey McLean and a, a political operative from Washington, D.C. called Stephen Halper. And McLean and Halper met in 1980 when they were both working on George Bush's presidential campaign. And uh, Halper later was, was head of the policy uh, group for Bush. And then when Reagan uh, became the nominee and, and Bush was named vice, pre uh, vice presidential candidate, Halper went to work for their campaign as part of the policy group and was actually uh, a high-level official in what they called the October Surprise Group the group that was trying to determine whether or not Carter was going to pull off an October surprise and get the Iranian hostages home or whatever. My, and Halper was, was uh, in charge of this group. His father-in-law was Ray Klein, who was the former deputy director of intelligence of the CIA. Klein was working with them, with Bush. And then when, when Reagan and Bush won, uh, Halper went to work for the State Department. They created a position for him. And James Baker, by the way, was the one that brought Halper over to the Reagan-Bush team after Reagan became the nominee from, from the Bush team. So, and Harvey McLean was a businessman from Shreveport, Louisiana, and he was being financed by none other than Herman K. Beebe, the mafia associate. McLean <laughs> moves to Dallas and buys Paris Savings Alone in Paris, Texas and is borrowing money from Vernon Savings, from Continental Savings in Houston. And uh, later, of course, all these loans go bad and Paris goes bust. And McLean's business deals cost taxpayers probably over $100 million. But that's kind of getting ahead of the story. Back in 83, McLean and Halper are taking a trip to China and they start talking about, let's get a bank in Washington, D.C. And so they, they start Palmer National Bank. Palmer was named after uh, McLean's grandmother and daughter. And the capital, the $3 million capital to start the bank came from Herman K. Beebe and Bozier, 
a bank and trust. The Beavis guy bank. connected to the mob in Louisiana. Right. Right. He, seem, and, he and seems to, to be everywhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and to Mesher, and to Ben Barnes, and John Connolly, uh, all these people. Um, so, when, as soon as they start this bank, they begin lending money to conservative Republican PACs like uh, Bob Dole and uh, Jack Kemp. And then they take on another client, the National Endowment for the Preservation of Liberty, which was started by Oliver North and a guy named Spitz Channel to funnel private donations to the Contras. Okay, and of course the biggest donor was Ellen Garwood uh, here in, in Austin, the widow of the former Supreme Court Justice. Um, and Palmer National Bank was also lending money to uh, the National Endowment uh, for operating loans and for furniture loans and helping funnel the money. That's where they had the, the bank, would, the money would go from Palmer National Bank to uh, another Washington bank to the Cayman Islands and then over to Geneva, Switzerland um, in, in the bank account uh, at, at Credit Suisse where um, not only was Contra money being flowed into, but Iranian arms profits were also Secord being... Secord was operating yes, that. Yes, that was Secord's. And then, then it would go out to the Contras. And Palmer was the, was the starting point of the money. And uh, Palmer National Bank also made a, a loan on a, uh, a beach house in Solano Beach, California, that B.B. and Dixon uh, would use to entertain uh, SNL regulators, <laughs> including L.L. Uh, L. Bowman. Uh, in fact, the mayor, that's where he allegedly uh, uh, had a tryst with a prostitute uh, in that beach house. And Palmer National Bank had a piece of the action on, on that uh, beach house. And uh, later, Stephen Halper was, when he got caught in the debate gate scandal, if you recall that, uh, the, the, the theft of the Carter debating uh, manuals that ended up in the Reagan Bush campaign that apparently uh, James Baker or William Casey or both of them were involved in. And that was just part of an enormous covert action against right. the Carter administration, which they had something like 137 operatives at all kinds of high levels, uh, spying, snooping, and even stealing top secret documents. And this is just one of their right. uh, well, Halp, operations. Yeah, that's correct. Well, Halper was involved in that. And he, of course, his name surfaced in 1984 when this came out, and he had to sort of leave. He kind of backed out of Palmer National Bank. Uh, but he stayed in touch with these people, of course. And then when Oliver North was fired by Reagan in November 1986, when the, when the scheme where they were, you know, using profits from the Iranian uh, arms deals to fund the Contras, and it all came tumbling out, and Reagan fired North, the very last entry in Oliver North's White House diaries was legal defense firm dash Stephen Halper, our old Palmer National Bank guy. Who also, again, I want to make this October Surprise connection because uh, Halper was the head of the October Surprise Committee for the uh, Reagan election team in 1980, which was frightened to death that the Carter administration was going to negotiate the release of the hostages, which may be one of the reasons why they stole the debate book, as well as did these other covert actions against Carter, because they wanted to find out what he was doing for this hostage release, and if possible, subvert it and give the Iranians a better deal. At least that's the account that Gary Sick and others give. That's correct. And which was in the middle of it. And how it worked out that way. They rigged a deal so that uh, the Iranians would hold the hostages until after the election and in return for arms. And lo and behold, uh, 20 minutes after Reagan raised his hand and said that he would ruin the country, the, uh, uh, the hostages were released. Well, and, and here we have this little bank, you know, that was involved in all this being financed with Louisiana Mafia money. And uh, when Herman K. Beebe was convicted, first convicted in 1985, of course, they moved that loan out of Bossier Bank to a little savings and loan in Beaumont, Texas, called uh, San Jacinto Savings, different from San Jacinto in Houston. And if you look at the, the board members of that bank, you find uh, two people who were uh, major stockholders in the casinos, uh, Caesars uh, Casino in Las Vegas that, of course, was, was being uh, skimmed by the Chicago Mafia at that time. So it's absolutely incredible how all this is connected. October Surprise, Iran-Contra, SNL, Mafia, CIA, all of the, William Casey, all of these operations under the Reagan administration were interconnected as well as the players.
And that you find the same people and the same threads running through uh, these these operations, and and the money, you know, from SNL is going into these operations. Wow. Can you tell us another story about a landing strip in Lajitas, Texas? Uh, yes. Um, I first found out about uh, the possible connections to the savings and loans and the CIA in, I guess, the fall of 1988 when a woman in Houston called up uh, my associate at the Houston Post, Greg C., and uh, told him, berated him about uh, some of our coverage of SNLs that weren't getting the whole story. So we went to see her. Uh, her name was Rebecca Sims. She had been Robert Corson, uh, Mishra's former son-in-law, his accountant. And uh, she had quit because she'd been asked to commit bankruptcy and tax fraud. And so she started investigating Corson. And she found out that Corson had been an uh, asset of the CIA. And um, when she first told me that, uh, I, I really wasn't interested in it at all. Um, I had no interest in it. I wasn't looking for the CIA. I was looking for the Mafia. And I guess I was even a little disappointed. But when I went back to my office, I, I remembered several things. One. When we had done the story on Walter Misher and had been calling everybody, all his people he knew, and just to get background information on him, uh, one of his close associates told me about the, the 700,000 acres in Belize, in Central America, that he had bought into, and that, that his associate thought that this was a CIA operation. And this was someone who was very close to Misher and pr would not say something like that unless he knew it had something to, and I sort of filed that you know, away in my mind. I remember that came up, and then I remember there was an organized crime strike force prosecutor in Kansas City that was chasing Mario Renda, the New York mob money broker. And uh, I, had been, I was chasing Renda too, so we had a lot of contact. And I'd been sending him our stories we'd been writing in the Houston Post. And he said almost the same thing Rebecca Sims had said, you're missing something big here, there's something you're not getting. And so I wondered if he was talking about the CIA. So I, I flew up to Kansas City and, and met with him, and sure enough, that was it. He was talking about the CIA. So that's how the CIA connection arose. And, and uh, Rebecca Sims had been told about the CIA connection from a man named Richard Brennicky. Oh um, my gosh. He's, his name pops up in October all kinds surprise, of October surprise, surprise, contra, yeah. contra uh, drugs. Drugs. <laughs> Renicky, uh had been the sort of renegade intelligence agent in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, he had received a lot of notoriety, notoriety because he had, some of the breaking stories on Iran-Contra had come from him on the Iranian arms deals and some of the Contra arms deals. And the New York Times and Newsweek had used him as a major source. And so, um, I went up to see Brennicky, and I, I, I spent a week with him. Uh, and when I, when I got back, uh, I really didn't have much because Brennicky didn't have a lot of documents backing up what he was saying. It was a very frustrating experience with Brennicky. I mean, he's, he's a typical kind of intelligence agent that will, will deliberately lie to you on some occasions. I mean, you, you just can't trust everything he tells you. But on, on the other hand, he will tell you the truth on a number of occasions. And, he, at one point in our conversations, began describing a landing strip in far west Texas uh, that had been a CIA guns for drugs deal, uh, you know, guns and drugs transshipment point. And he said they flew C 130s in and out of there as a 4,000 foot. So I, I ripped a, a big sheet of paper out of my legal notebook and I said, Draw me a map. You know, so he starts drawing this map, and here was Lajitas, which is west of Big Ben. As you go, he said, about 10 miles northeast, and there's this mesa. And he had a very detailed map, 4,000 feet. He gave me the, the, uh, the way it was oriented, uh, the fact that there was a mountain just north of it, and there was a mesa there. And, and so I took that back to Houston with me, um, hoping, you know, I didn't, maybe this would check out. So I, I got a, uh, a USGS Class A topo map of the area, which I, am, I was absolutely positive would show a landing strip that big 4,000 feet. And I get the map out and I look at it and I can see about where it should have been according to his, his map and there was nothing on the map. And so I said, well, I'll give it one more shot. I'll get the aerial photographs that they use to make these maps. They take aerial photographs. And so I ordered the aerial photographs. And I got him out, and I, I looked at him, and there it was, right exactly where the landing strip. 
Oh. Exactly where he described it. And the FAA had no record of this. It wasn't on the, any map. And so I went out, out to that, to uh, it's about 15 miles northeast of Lajitas, and about, oh, I'd say less than 10 miles from Terlingua, and actually drove out to it and looked at it and began talking to people about it and basically got it confirmed that it was a uh, C-130s flew in there with arms and drugs. And, uh, and Brennicke had told me that when he flew in there, uh, that he asked the people he was flying in there with who were people, by the way, associated with the Medellin cartel, whose landing strip this was. He was told it was, Wal they told him Walter Misher. Now, Misher owns, uh, at that time, it owned probably close to 300,000, maybe more acres in that area, but he didn't own that piece of property. He had land to the west of it and land to the south of it. So when I began researching who owned this property, I found a widow in Florida actually owned that property, and she had never been there in her life, and only found out a, a few years before I talked to her that a landing strip was there because one of her relatives went hunting and told her, did you know there's a landing strip right in the middle of your property? And she said no. And uh, she said it was done without her knowledge or permission. And of course, what a great, it was actually the only place in that area, that's a very rough, rugged country there uh, just west of Big Bend. It was the only level place for miles and miles around in that vicinity that you could put a landing strip. And of course, if, if a, a widow from Florida who's never been there owns it, um, and just about anybody wanted to probably could go. And of course, the law enforcement had to know about it. When you talk to them, you get contradictory answers and inconsistent answers, and, and they're trying to cover up, obviously. Uh, although they would acknowledge that they'd seen C-130s in the vicinity. Hmm. Well, there's no reason for C-130s. Of course, there is a uh, low-level training route for C-130s out of San Antonio in that area. What a, what a perfect cover, of course, for flying in C-130s. Can we get up to a higher level of politics again? Uh, Mr. Clean, uh, Mr. Benson. Lloyd Benson, uh, he's connected with this in some way. Yeah, I ran into Benson in, in a number of places. Uh, the first place I ran into Lloyd Benson was in Jefferson Savings, which was in uh, the Rio Grande Valley, I believe in McAllen. Uh, Jefferson Savings had been started by Lloyd Benson and his brother and Benson's father back in the mid-50s. And they controlled it up until the mid-70s when they sold it to a man named Guillermo Hernandez Cartaya. Uh, Cartaya is one of, one of the really bad boys of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> I mean, he, he's a Cuban exile, fought in the Bay of Pigs, was a member of the infamous uh, 2506 Brigade, uh, had been involved in, in narcotics trafficking, money laundering, gun running, terrorist activities out of Florida with a company called World Finance. The IRS and the FBI had close to 200 people investigating world finance in the mid-70s. And Alt was ready to pop Cartaya big when the CIA stopped them and came in and, and basically had the, the investigation dismantled. And uh, as a result, Cartaya was just convicted on income tax charges. At that very same time, he comes and buys Jefferson Savings from the Benson family. Okay, and proceeds to loot it and run drug money through it. Uh, when the Justice Department came in to investigate Cartaya, was brought in by the Texas regulators and, and Art Leiser, who was the chief SNL examiner for the state of Texas, brought in the feds. Um, the CIA came down and met with the prosecutor and asked him to back off Cartaya because of all the favors Cartaya had done for our government, including, it turns out, scamming about $30 million from a uh, United Arab Emirates bank uh, with the apparent permission of the CIA. <laughs> um, and Cartaya, the, the, the Justice Department did not back off Cartaya on that deal. He was convicted, but his sentence was rolled into his IRS sentence. And I don't know how many years, he probably only did a couple of years in jail. The next year after that happened, uh, Cartaya was again indicted along with his partner, Camilo Padreda, another Cuban exile in Miami. That indictment was stopped for some reason. Uh, the Justice Department said later it was flawed. Uh, 
but if it's flawed, <laughs> why don't they draw it up? Uh, Camila Padreda shows up 10 years later as a partner of Jeb Bush, the president's son in Miami. Now, um, when I found out about Cartaya and also Jefferson Saves the fact that Lloyd Benson had you know, owned part of that, I called up Benson's office to ask him about it. I got his press secretary, Jack DeVore. I asked him my questions, you know, what, what was Benson's role in this SNL, you know, what he, did he own, did he know Cartaya, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, DeVore said he'd get back to me that the senator was in some conference on the Canary Islands, which is off the coast of Africa. About an hour later, DeVore calls me back and said the senator never owned any stock in this SNL, doesn't know anything about it, never had anything to do with it. I said, are you sure about this? He said, yes, I satisfied myself. He doesn't recall owning anything. And I said, well, that's funny. I got a document here from the SNL uh, department that shows he owned 16.7% of the original stock and continued to own it up into the 60s. And these, these signatures are notarized. He said, well, I'll get back to you. <laughs> 30 minutes later, I get a call from Lloyd Benson himself from the Canary Islands saying, oh yes, he had owned stock in that, but he got out of it uh, in the mid-60s and, and bought in uh, Brazosport Savings, which later became Continental Savings. Okay, and uh, then I asked him about Cartaya, so he knew, knew it, I said, what about the CIA interference? He assured me that hadn't happened because he would have known about it. Well, in fact, I got this story straight from the prosecutor that the CIA went to. And so either Benson lied to DeVore or DeVore lied to me. There's no other explanation for it. I mean, they, somebody lied. I mean, they told me a lie, that Benson had never been owned any stock in this SNL. And if I hadn't had that document, they would have gotten away with the lie. Now, uh, it's interesting to note that this SNL that, that Benson bought after he got out of uh, Jefferson uh, became Continental Savings, and that purchase was financed by Herman K. Beebe. So it's possible that mafia money went to Lloyd Benson. Now when I asked DeVore about that, he said they, they didn't know that BB was financing Kelly, and so had no knowledge, Carol Kelly, the guy that owned it, whether mob money, this was mob money or not. And in fact, it was. Well, didn't Benson also uh, later, in, uh, when he was running as vice president, didn't he put the kibosh on any uh, uh, investigation or statements in any of the debates about the SNLs? Isn't that part of your book, too? Yes, well, in, you know, in 1988, um, the country knew we had an SNL problem, but we didn't know the extent of it. Okay, the, the original estimates had been something like maybe 10, 15 million dollars. Uh, the Republicans, of course, with Bush as the candidate, did not bring up the S, you know, the, I mean, Bush's son, Neil, was right in the middle of Silverado Savings, uh, which was about to be taken down. In fact, was taken down only a couple of weeks after the presidential election. Someone in Washington, had called the regulators in Topeka, Kansas that regulated Silverado and told them not to shut Silverado down until after the presidential election. And that's, in fact, what happened. On the other side, Benson was the Democratic vice presidential nominee. He went to the Dukakis campaign people and told them not to bring up the SNL crisis. And so they did, the Democrats did not use that as an issue. And they could have pounded the Republicans over the head with it. Uh, and maybe won the election in perhaps, 1988. Perhaps. And of course, we had, you know, we had the Keating Five. Four of the Keating Five were Democrats. I mean, the Democratic Congress had just as much to answer for as the Republican administration. And so neither side wanted to bring it up. Of course, both sides were being paid off by, by people like Misher. I mean, they, they always cover their bets. The, the people like Misher, you know, they support both sides. So regardless of who wins, they've got an end. And George Bush and Lloyd Benson are part and parcel of this same small Houston businessman circle that Walter Misher is at the middle of, Joe Russo is part of, and a guy named Jim Bath, a CIA operative in Houston, uh, is good friends with George Bush and George Bush's son, George W. Bush, and, and has done investments for Lloyd Benson and was in business with Lloyd Benson's son. And Bath, of course, ties in with Misher. He got loans from Misher's bank. I and mean, it's all a very tight little circle here uh, that, that I mean, Bush and Benson are, are two peas in a pod uh, as far as being controlled and, and dealing with and have friendship with the same people.
And what about any other connections that Benson might have to the SNL crisis other than him owning this one uh, SNL for 20 years? Did he have investments in, uh, or connections with other SNLs who were involved in the crisis, or did he do things as a senator that might be involved in making sure there's no investigations, et cetera? Well, I'm not, I don't know if he ever directly intervened, but he certainly didn't push for it. And he was head of the Senate Finance Committee that could have done all sorts of investigations. He never did. I mean, in, in fact, he did his best to see that the SNL crisis was not brought up. Um, he had three savings and loans at one time that all ended up in the hands of either the mafia or the CIA people. Uh, Jefferson Savings went to Cartaya. Uh, Continental Savings went to Carol Kelly, it was financed completely by Herman K. Beebe, and Ben Franklin Savings later ended up in the hands of Walter Misher. Now th this in and of itself is absolutely incredible that SNLs or banks or any institution can be sold to mafia-controlled groups. How is this even possible? Well, it's possible because um, uh, the people in power either don't know or don't want to know that these are mafia people. I mean, we don't, you know, the Justice Department had not done the kind of investigation required. The Federal Home Loan Bank Board wasn't doing investigations, uh, and the press was not reporting. Of course, everybody knew who Beebe was. From the, the Dallas Morning News wrote about Beebe and the Texas Renovac scandal, but seemed to forget about it, you know, 10 years later when they're back involved in SNLs. And no one, you know, raised, I mean, when you've got Congress not doing anything, we've got the Justice Department not doing anything, we've got the press not doing anything, the, the public is not going to find out, and, and nobody's going to know. And what did Benson say, that he didn't know that these were mafia right. connections, that uh, he just sold his interests and someone bought them and he didn't investigate? Well, I think he knew who he was selling to, but he, he could say we didn't know the money was coming from the mafia. Well, that's, you know, that's the kind of ignorance we don't need if, it, if indeed he didn't know. I mean, it's, it's an ignorance that's almost criminal. I mean, if it's not, if it's not, he didn't do anything criminal by actually knowing and intending that it happened. His ignorance borders on recklessness. Pete, we have a lot more questions for you, and we're out of time for this program. But uh, would you like to continue on and do a second program? We want to get into how you got this story and the incredible information that you got and then wove together and the problems you had in getting uh, stories uh, printed uh, and also getting the book published. Uh, we, would, you, would you stay here and do us sure. uh, the favor of that? Sure. Great, thank you. That's the end of this Alternative Views. Then you start saying something big is going on here, and you start pushing. I mean, if we hadn't run into the roadblocks, we might have stopped with that first story. But when you start running it everywhere, people covering up, the government not doing anything, nobody seeming to care where are these billions of dollars went or cared to try to get them back, that's when you start looking, for, you know, you know you've got a big story. And I, I told the editor, who was Alice Mayhew, who was Bob Woodward's editor, a very famous editor, you know, that the book needed to go before the election and we needed to get going. And she said she wasn't going to do it. They were not going to do the book before the election. And I said, why not? You know, with all this stuff about Bush, the American public needs to know. And she said, quote, George Bush is going to win anyway. His writings on the mob, the CIA, and George Bush have been ignored by the irregular media and the Congress, subjected to censorship in Houston. But now Pete Bruton talks freely on alternative views. Thank you.
Welcome to the second part of our Alternative Views interview with author Pete Bruton. Pete has just pub published a book called The Mafia, CIA, and George Bush. And in our last program, we told how Pete analyzed the connection between the CIA and the SNL fraud and how he discovered that George Bush and his family, unsavory folks connected to the CIA and the Mafia, as well as associates of Texas big shots such as Senator Lloyd Benson and Houston power broker Walter Mischer were all involved in the SNL fraud, which was one of the greatest U.S. financial catastrophes and crimes in our history. Today, however, we're going to talk about how Pete came to break this story, about his experiences as a Houston Post reporter in which he discovered the connections between the SNL and the CIA scandal, how he decided to write a book, his experiences with Simon and & Schuster, and how he finally got his book published, and what the response of the book by the media has been. You've been tracking this SNL thing for a long time. What is the magnitude of the scandal? Well, we, we all hear about it. it's going to cost uh, taxpayers about $500 billion. Uh, that includes a little over $200 billion of actual losses that the SNLs have incurred that fail, that, that the taxpayers are going to have to pay back. But when you throw in interest and carrying costs, you get over $500 billion in direct costs. But the other costs are almost as bad. What these fraudulent SNLs did was create an artificial real estate bubble where they inflated real estate values artificially uh, very much, and then the bu bubble burst. And that sort of spread out, that, the, the fallout from that spread to the banks and insurance companies and any other financial institutions that were lending on, on real estate. And so one of the reasons the banks are in big trouble now is their real estate portfolio. And the, the larger a, a, such a portfolio a bank has, the more trouble it's in. So uh, the, the effects spread out through the economy in, in, in the real estate value. So it's not just $500 billion, which is an incredible hit, but also the indirect real estate effects. I guess also you could crank into this the amount of money that was skimmed and uh, stolen by all these people was money which did not go into productive resources so that we're losing out from that aspect also. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, when you think about that somebody has estimated that the actual cost when, when we start paying it back to, ta to taxpayers is going to be $25 billion a year from now on, forever. You think about what $25 billion every year, what we could have used for that. And then when you think about the money was basically looted and stolen, and that Congress and the Justice Department are not trying to get it back. And that's one of the keys to all this is tracing the money and also trying to recover it uh, there's been none of that. I mean, Congress doesn't want to do it because they're involved up to their eyeballs. When you start tracing this money, like you did with the Keating Five, you find it comes in, some of it comes back to their own campaign, tr you know, chess. And uh, the Justice Department, which is controlled by the, the president, of course, has not tried to track the money. They're interested in just getting uh, the front men and the cutouts and the middle men to cop guilty pleas and, and go to jail maybe for a year or two and then go on to the next one. So they rack up all these convictions, but they don't try to really figure out what happened and where the money went and who benefited. Pete, one of the reasons why the government has not done any real prosecution or investigation of this scandal is because they've been involved in it, going all the way to the top up to George uh, Bush. We didn't really get into last time the complicity of George Bush's son, Neil, in a SNL scandal, the Silverado case. Perhaps we can go into that as an illustration of how the SNL scandal worked and the complicity of top establishment officials in this crisis. Sure. We all know that Neil was a director of Silverado Savings in Denver, Colorado, and that uh, when he was on the board of directors, he was being supported financially by a couple of Dis Denver businessmen named Ken Good and Bill Walters. At the same time, Walters and Good were borrowing huge amounts of money from Silverado. And in fact, Neil got his hand slapped in administrative action for approving loans to his business associate, Bill Walters. Um, what we don't know, what hasn't come out really before, are the connections between not only Good and Walters, uh, but to other Silverado borrowers, to mafia people and to the CIA. 
And we find that if you look at, say, Bill Walters. Bill Walters was the largest borrower at Silverado Savings. Uh, he signed on about $130 million of loans. In addition, uh, he sold property to Silverado of about $90 million. Uh, Walters was a Denver architect. Walters and his partners, including a guy named Richard Ross Miller, were involved in the Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal back in the mid-70s with Herman K. Beebe. I mean, Beebe was in, and Ben Barnes were involved in, in deals with these people. And Beebe specifically had transferred about a million dollars to Richard Ross Miller, Bill, Bill Walters' partner. And they had all owned a bank in Marshall, Texas that was involved in the Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal. And uh, we find that Walters was also apparently and had been accused of transferring some of his ill-gotten gains to a trust on the Isle of Jersey that was being uh, funneled, drug money was being laundered through it by people in Miami, and SNL money from uh, people like Robert Corson, the CIA agent, was going also going through this trust fund. Uh, Ken Good who borrowed over $40 million from Silverado and was Neil Bush's sugar daddy for several years, uh, had also borrowed money from Western Savings in Dallas. It was part of the Herman K. Beebe circle. Um, the biggest company that actually dealt with Silverado was MDC Holdings, it was, whose chief executive is Larry Mizell. Uh, Mizell was a big Republican donor. Uh, he held fundraisers that George Bush went to uh, and Mizell had established trust funds by, done by a Chicago law firm uh, whose partner was Burton Cantor. Burton Cantor was one of the founding uh, fathers of Castle Bank and Trust, the uh, bank in the Bahamas that the Mafia and the CIA were using. Uh, he was involved with uh, CIA projects, uh, Mafia projects in California and, and other Mafia figures. Um, and here we have his trust, you know, Larry Mizell's trust fund being set up by Burton Cantor's law firm. And Burton Cantor was also a close associate of Lawrence Freeman, the Miami lawyer who had worked for Paul Hellowell, the CIA founding father, and worked for the mafia and had been involved in the big Florida land deal that uh, Robert Corson's SNL was funding. We find this circle, you start pulling on this thread, you look at the people involved in Silverado, and you're back with the mafia and the CIA. Now, how did Neil Bush get involved in all of this? What was his initial connection with uh, Silverado? Well, and what did he get out of it? Neil Bush uh, had gone to Denver after getting out of, of, of college and was a landman for Amico, I believe, which meant he went and tried to secure leases so they could drill on the land. And then uh, Bill Walters, uh, and Ken Good set him up in his own company. Okay, they were both big Republican donors. Uh, Ken Good went to the inauguration party with Neil Bush in Houston in 1988 when Bush won. Uh, Bush visited Bill Walters' home in the 1984 campaign. Bill Walters tore up all his brown grass and laid new green grass on his lawn just for George Bush's visit. Okay, they were pumping money into Neil Bush's company that was drilling dry holes in Wyoming, was not making any money. He was being, basically, his salary was being paid by these people. And his company got a big line of credit at Bill Walters Bank. So they were supporting him. Ken Good put, put him on the board of directors of a Florida company he had and was paying him over $100,000 a year in director's fees. Oh I mean, outrageous. Uh, $12,000 mean, $12, a month was going uh, to Neil Bush uh, for just serving on Ken Good's board. They were basically keeping him going. Uh, and Protect, he bought a, Protection money, it sounds like. Well, you know, it's almost somebody made the analogy that Neil Bush was sort of like the driver of the getaway car. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the cops weren't going to shoot at the president's son. And so far, all we've had is one indictment. The, uh, the CEO, uh, Michael Wise, is the only indictment so far on Silverado savings. Now, what about Neil Bush and Silverado? What role did he play well, he was in a, particular? Well, he was a director, and in a, he approved loans uh, to his buddy, Bill Walters. He also approved loans uh, to the second largest borrower at Silverado was a Houston con man named E. Trine Starnes. <laughs> uh, Starnes borrowed $77.5 million from Silverado six months after he donated $30,000 to the Contras. 
and went and had a meeting with Ronald Reagan and Oliver North. Uh, and he also borrowed over $25 million from Continental Savings in Houston that was supported by mafia money from Herman K. Beebe. And uh, Starnes was also involved with John Riddle, the guy who was uh, transshipping arms to the Middle East and had, had gotten support from uh, Allied Bank, Walter Mischer's bank. And he turns out to be the second largest borrower at Silverado Savings. Uh, so Neil Bush was, was basically just sitting on the board almost like a figurehead, but approving these loans and uh, you know helping his buddies out. And, and getting paid also for it as a director. Right, mm -hmm. that's correct. No, though not nearly as much as he got from, from being a director on Ken Goode's company. Let's talk about how you got this incredible story. Now, your book is, to me, a masterpiece in the sense that everything is so complex. There's so many interconnections and so many layers of activity, and yet you were able to lay it out uh, so that it, uh, it makes sense and you can follow it. Uh, my first question is, how did you get all this voluminous material and keep track of it? Well, I've been working on it for over five years. I mean, anybody can <laughs> probably collect that much information in five years. You know, you, you, I've got three, four-drawer file cabinets full of documents that, uh, that support all this information. But, I mean, you just take one step at a time. And, and when I first started on the SNL story in the spring of 87, and looking at one deal at Mainland Savings in Houston, the, when it failed in 86, was the largest failure in the country. And you start running into roadblocks and people not talking, you can't get documents and nobody's being prosecuted and the money isn't being tracked and nobody's trying to get the money back. Then you start saying something big is going on here and you start pushing. I mean, if we hadn't run into the roadblocks, we might have stopped with that first story. But when you start running it everywhere, people covering up, the government not doing anything, nobody seeming to care where are these billions of dollars went or cared to try to get them back, that's when you start looking, for, you know, you know you've got a big story. And so you just keep going. I mean, and everywhere I looked, I found something. It was like, I mean, being in the oil business, everywhere you, you, you dig a hole, you hit oil. I mean, every rock you turn over, something scurries out from under it. And uh, it, it's just, a, it was a wonderful story in that sense. Well, you even have, I mean, you, you, divorce decrees were significant. Things yes. like this. Yeah, right. Well, you know, the, the SNLs do not, the documents at the SNLs are not public. The loan documents, where the money went, the closing documents, the public can't get them. Reporters cannot get them. We cannot track the money. We don't have subpoena power. So the things you rely on are lawsuits, and deed records, basically. And so uh, the divorce decrees are, and divorce lawsuits are very, they have a lot of good information in them. Pete, let's um, go into the history of how you actually came to uh, write this book, starting with your first stories with the Houston Post. In the spring of 86, I was working on stories involving charitable foundations and hospitals that were not doing enough services for the poor. And um, a business reporter at the Post named Greg C. got an anonymous call from a guy that we had, we dealt with for over two years. And we, his nickname was DT, which was, you know, our, short for Deep Throat. And uh, <laughs> for a long time, we didn't even know who, who he was. Well, this guy calls up Greg and tells him that he should start investigating mainland savings. And there it deals with a man named Howard Pulver. So Greg starts doing this. And we eventually found out that Pulver and his partners had over 300 companies. And they were doing deals with mainland all over Houston. And Greg just found himself drowning in a sea of records. There were thousands and thousands of pages of records in the, the, the real property records of Harris County on these deals with mainland. So I was asked just to come help him sort out the records. And we, we did that, and then we went and interviewed Raymond Hill the chief executive officer of Mainland Savings. And Hill's attitude uh, was, was the most arrogant that I've ever encountered in, in my career as a reporter. And uh, basically, he accused us at one point of, of stumbling in the same direction as the FBI. And I knew I had a big story, just the way he was acting like, we can't touch him. And, and uh, sort of really thumbing his nose at us that I knew that there was a big story there, and, and we immediately ran into the mafia. Uh, 
there was a, when we were trying to track the deal with, with Howard Pulver, who lived in Kings Point, Long Island, outside New York, and his partners were all from New York City. They came down and took close to $100 million out of mainland savings, left them with, with promissory notes that were worth, you know, probably less than $10 million. Uh, a huge ripoff and contributed greatly to the failure of mainland savings. Um, at the same time he was doing this, uh, Mario Renda was brokering money into mainland. In fact, there was an indictment in Brooklyn by the Organized Crime Strike Force talking about the money Mario Renda was skimming off of his uh, deposits uh, and placing in various SNLs, and one of them was mainland. Uh, so we knew we had something made. We went up to New York City and we found uh, Renda's partner in this was a guy named Martin Schwimmer, who was also laundering money for the Lucchese Mafia family. Okay, when we went to talk to, to Howard Pulver and to Martin Schwimmer, we found they lived across the street from each other in Kings Point, New York, which is a very wealthy uh, suburban enclave on the North Shore of Long Island, very exclusive. And so here we had Schwimmer pumping maybe $100 million in deposits into mainland, and the guy who lives across the street from him taking about $100 million out the back door. <laughs> and so we knew we had something very big then. And then when we found, we started tracking Renda, and then we heard about Herman K. Beebe, Louisiana Mafia Associate, who was involved in all the failed Texas SNLs. We started tracking BB, and then we find BB and Renda together at so many different places. I mean, here's a, as a New York Mafia associate and a Louisiana Mafia associate, both at the same places, at the same times across the country. So, you know, we knew that there was a big, big story here. Were you shocked or surprised to see that the Mafia was active in looting these SNL banks in Texas, or had you studied organized crime before? Just on a couple of occasions we'd run into it. I mean, the, the myth is there's no organized crime in Texas, and it's, uh, it's, it's wrong. It's just flat wrong. Uh, there, are all, there are a couple of small indigenous mafia families in Texas, but no big mafia family. But it, Texas is basically under the aegis of the Louisiana, the Carlos Marcello mafia family. and, and is there's a lots of mafia activity in, in Texas. I mean, of course, anytime you have, you know, people like the oil, Texas oil men that naturally like to gamble. I mean, the way the mafia gets their, their foot in the door and their fingers into a community, a new community, is through gambling. I mean, that's the way they do it. And, and of course, oil men naturally love, anybody who likes to gamble has got all that money. I mean, they're going to have to, if you bet big on anything illegally, you're dealing with the mafia, probably whether you know it or not, and if you don't pay up, you're going to find out in a hurry. There's a price you pay. <laughs> yeah, and, and we found that if you look at all the, uh, the congressional crime uh, committees and, and their studying of Carlos Marcello, you find in one case where he was talking to a Houston oil man named uh, Josie in one case, and, and we find uh, John Meekham Jr., uh, the Houston oil man, uh, dealing with the Marcellos. Um, so, I mean, it's, you find them in Texas and dealing with a lot of the big wheeler dealers and, and power brokers. Uh, the story was, uh, this, uh, was running in the Houston Post, but I've noticed in studying uh, local power structures in the media that the, usually the local uh, media don't take on or expose any of the activities of local power brokers. But you were writing about Misher. Well, I was writing about him, but none of the stories on Misha were running. Okay. All the um, were censored. Eh? Yeah. Um, when we had done, oh, we spent two years working on the Mafia, and then we found out about the CIA, and, and um, I spent another year working on the CIA, and that's where I ran into Misha's former son-in-law, Robert Corson, and then all the, the connections, uh, when I started looking at Misha, the connections of Misha to the SNL players. Um, and that took me about a year to do. And in the fall of 1989, we were ready to run with the CIA SNL stories. And Walter Mischer, of course, was the center, in the center of it. And, and his, his story, the story about him, was scheduled to lead it off. I mean, because he's the glue that holds all this together. And it's very difficult to understand the story without Walter Mischer. Now, there may be somebody above Mischer telling him what to do. 
And I was told by a couple of people in Houston that there is indeed. But I was never able to identify that person if indeed that person exists. But Misher was, is the key middleman, the key broker of all the deals. And without him, it's very difficult to understand these stories. The stories were scheduled to run in the, in the, the winter of 1989. Uh, we sent them over to the Houston Post law firm, Fulbright and Jaworski, to read for libel. They sort of read all the stories for libel and try to give us advice. Uh, usually, uh, they, they, they had the authority, although they shouldn't have, uh, to kill stories that they thought might get us in, into libel trouble. Well, Fulbright and Jaworski went through the ceiling on Misher. They immediately reacted, now we can't run this stuff, and gave a lot of bogus reasons for not doing so. So we began in, in, the, uh, in, in February of 1990 to run the CIA stories, but nothing on Misher. We had Corson, we had uh, a Kansas City guy named Farhad Azima, uh, we had a little savings and loan in Lano called Peoples that was, was lending money to CIA people in Florida. Uh, we had Silverado Savings and, and San Jacinto. We ran all these, these stories, but nothing on Misher. And um, we ran out of stories eventually in the, in the summer of 1990. It must have been difficult to write your story with the main actor not being able Very to. Very difficult. <laughs> and, and most of the national media reacted negatively. I mean, they, they did not pick up the story. Um, they said, you know, they, it was too hard to understand and a lot of other reasons. But I think, and also the Houston Post is to blame for, for one thing, for not running a big series. They would just have one story and wait several weeks and run another one and wait. And I think it's just because they were afraid of the story. You know, they were afraid, you know, they just kind of wanted to stick their little foot in the water and, and see if it got bit off and, and then run another one if it didn't. And uh, so they were, they were released sporadically and uh, there was no mystery in it. So a lot of the, the national media did not pick up on I don't know if we'd run them as a series and had mystery whether the, they'd have had any more impact. It's difficult to tell. Yeah. The national media really, uh, uh, handles the CIA with kid gloves. And we can talk about that later, <laughs> why, if you'd like to. But anyway, um, we'd run out of stories, so we, I went back to the Misher stuff, and I tried to get that in again. And uh, the editors signed off on it. They approved it. I thought I'd met all of Fulbright and Jaworski's objections, and they were scheduled to run in the last of December of 1990. And then, at the very last moment, uh, Fulbright Jaworski refused to sign off on the stories. The editors, even though the city editor uh, wanted to run them and, and really recommended running them over Fulbright and Jaworski's uh, objections, the editor-in-chief decided uh, not to do it, not to do the Misher stories. Now, during this period, I was talking, I was at my folks' ranch. Uh, it was Christmas time. I was talking to the city editor and uh, the Fulbright and Jaworski associate that was handling the Mr. stuff was a guy named Tom Godbold. And I was talking on the phone to the city editor and said, Godbold won't sign off on him. And, and I, was, I was furious. And I said, you know, his job's probably on the line. I bet he won't get made partner if he doesn't kill these stories. You know, I was just, just talking. I was mad. Well, six weeks later, I'd taken a leave of absence to write work on the book. And I had lunch with the city editor. And he looked at me and said, guess what? Godbold just got made partner. And that's so a that, Fulbright and <coughs> Jaworski. So yeah. that's when I started looking for conflicts of interest. Now, a year and a half earlier, when Godbold was objecting to all the Misher stuff, I directly asked him, do you have any, does Fulbright and Jaworski have any conflicts of interest with these stories? And he said, not that I know of. Okay, when I, I found close to a dozen conflicts of interest including the fact that Fulbright and Jaworski was representing Misher's company in a wrongful death lawsuit. At the same time, they were telling us we couldn't run these stories about Walter Misher. In addition, they were also doing other things for Misher, as well as doing legal things for Palmer National Bank, this bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, they had represented Howard Pulver's company in, a, in an insurance deal and on, and they, they had laundered money uh, for, a, uh, for the CIA, basically, through the MD Anderson Foundation. Uh, and conflict after conflict I dug up on Fulbright and Jaworski. Now, I went to the Houston Post uh, 
I told them about these conflicts and the Houston Post did nothing. And so I knew that, that, that I could not go to back, back to work for the Houston Post if I'm gonna have to run everything through Fulbright and Jaworski who was ser serving as the ultimate editors on all these stories. So was it at this time you decided to go the book route that you'd resign from the Houston Post and try to write this up as a uh, book? Well, actually, uh, it had happened earlier. During the middle of the stories I was writing for the, uh, for the Post in the summer of 1990, Simon & Schuster came to me, actually approached me with an idea of writing a book for them. Uh, Simon & Schuster is either the first or second largest publishing company, uh, country in this a company in this country, and uh, very prestigious. And they flew me up to New York City and rolled out the red carpet and made me a very big offer to write the book for them. 100000 $100,000 you know. advance, which is probably bigger than any advance on a savings and loan book that has been, been written. And uh, so we began negotiating a contract. And I was insistent in the beginning, at the very beginning, that the book be published before the 1992 presidential election. When this is, in, by the way, the summer of 1990. And uh, because, not only because of what I'd found on George Bush, but what I'd found on Lloyd Benson. And at that time, it certainly wasn't beyond the realm of possibility that the 92 election was going to be Bush versus Benson. And in fact, if you recall, when Clinton had all the trouble in, earlier this year, with, in, in January and February, with Jennifer Flowers and the draft, he said that if he dropped out, he was going to throw his support behind Lloyd Benson. And now we have Benson being the leading candidate for the Secretary of Treasury. Okay, so I was pushing very hard, and, and uh, Fulbright and Jaworski actually modified their standard contract to shorten the time between acceptance and publication. You mean Simon and Schuster? Simon and Schuster, I'm sorry. To, to shorten the time between uh, acceptance and publication. And I eventually signed a contract with them. And, and when I took a leave of absence from the Post to write the book, I submitted the book on deadline. And uh, I, I got back an editing letter a couple of months after that that told me that something wasn't exactly right here because they wrote me a four-page letter that was just full of vague nonsense. I mean, it was not helpful at all. And uh, when I had submitted the manuscript on deadline, I, I again put in writing that the book had to be published before the 1992 election in writing. Um, so we began the editing process, and uh, I tried to accommodate their suggestions, and I really couldn't. I made some alternative suggestions. They okayed it. I submitted a revised manuscript in February uh, of this year, 92. And uh, after they got the revised manuscript, but before they'd even read it, they really cut me off. They would not return my phone calls, my faxes, my letters, nothing. Um, and so I was fairly desperate at that time. Um, and I knew that they had what they call their fall list, the list of all the books they publish in the latter part of the year. And I knew that my book had to be on there to get out before the election. And so when they wouldn't return my phone calls or talk to me, I eventually made an appointment just to fly out to New York City and see them. And at that, it was only at that time that, that, they, that they returned my phone call. And I, I told the editor, who was Alice Mayhew, who was Bob Woodward's editor, a very famous editor, you know, that the book needed to go before the election and we needed to get going. And she said she wasn't going to do it. They were not going to do the book before the election. And I said, why not? You know, all this stuff about Bush, the American public needs to know. And she said, quote, George Bush is going to win anyway. And of course, she turned out to be wrong, but even so, I, that struck me as nonsense. I mean, what difference does that make about getting, I mean, getting the information before the public? And, and what, how does she know that what's going to happen in, uh, it was, I guess, in 10 months <coughs> or so? Why, why do you think uh, Simon and Schuster refused to publish the book before the election. It was ready to go, right? Well, it was basically ready, and, it, and if they'd wanted to, they could have. I mean, it was not, I mean, Simon & Schuster is a very big company. I mean, I eventually got the book published before the election with a small company. I mean, they could have put two editors on it, and we could have done it. Mm -hmm. They didn't. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't want to speculate on their motives, but there's some interesting connections. In fact, I knew this going in. I knew 
about the connections between Simon & Schuster and George Bush and the Houston power brokers. Oh, what is that? Well, um, one of George Bush's best friends and, and longtime business associates, Hugh Ledke, chairman of the board of Pennzoil, is on the board of directors of Simon & Schuster's parent corporation, Paramount Communications. And uh, Hugh Ledke is actually in my book in regard to a, a very strange bank in Houston that he was on the board of. Also, Paramount Communications used to be a, the, is the uh, successor company to Gulf and Western, uh, the conglomerate that w one of the founding fathers is John Duncan of Houston, whose brother Charles was Secretary of Energy under the Carter administration. And these people are in investments with uh, people who connect to uh, Walter Misher and, and back to George Bush. And so I knew this going in. I just thought it'd be poetic justice for Simon & Schuster to publish this book. <laughs> You know, uh, but apparently they knew about it too. I guess. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Pete, you've been you've been dealing with some uh, pretty unsavory and dangerous characters here, the CIA and the mafia. Have you had any threats in your life, or you've been fearful of it? Well, I, I, not that I know of. I mean, I'm kind of slow. Maybe I got threatened and I didn't realize it, but uh, nothing directly. Uh, I mean, th these people usually leave reporters, and they don't you know, threaten reporters. I mean, they may try to keep the book from being published, or they might threaten you with, a, I mean, I've been threatened with lawsuits. Oh. I mean, they, they will do that, but not physically threatened. And, you know, they, the way they operate is to keep people like Simon Schuster from publishing the book, or keep anybody from publishing, or keeping it from being distributed. Um, and so, you know, they work indirectly, not, not, I mean, if anything happened to me, that would just bring more publicity on this, and which is the last thing they want. I mean, the, the way they're reacting to the book is that they're really sort of kind of hunkering down and ignoring it and figuring that any publicity will, will, will vanish eventually and disappear. Have you been contacted by Larry King yet or any of the no, talk I mean, shows? No, the national media has shown no interest in this. The, the one exception is the Village Voice that published a excellent uh, article on your book and on your research by uh, Jonathan uh, Quitney, who's also an investigative reporter of some um, renown. Right. That happened uh, when Simon & Schuster told me they were not going to publish before the election. Uh, I contacted Quitney. I had been in touch with Jonathan Quitney because he'd written a number of books on the, on the Mafia and the CIA. And, uh, you know, I wanted to sort of do a reality check and send the manuscript to Quitney and ask him whether he thought it should be published before the election, just to make sure that I wasn't hallucinating. Maybe Simon & Schuster was right. And so I sent the manuscript to Quitney, and he read it and agreed with me that it should be published before the election. And uh, he was helping me you know, get the information out and, and actually was, was, had gone to a number of different publications to try to do you know, a, a serialization of the book and eventually the Village Voice did it, but just barely before the election. And even though the book was printed four weeks before the election, uh, it really didn't get out. I mean, it should have been out in the summer. You know, I really apologize. I, I did everything that I knew how. And, and if so, you told somebody in, say, May of this year that you could get a book published in five months, they would have laughed at you. So it was not possible. Well. We did it, but just barely. Pete, let's uh, talk a little bit about the sort of final um, response of your work by the establishment, by journalists, uh, Congress, and then possibly the uh, public, and how you, you reacted to the sort of non-response of the sort of journalist establishment and then the Congress. You yourself was a, were a reporter for the Human Houston Post. You published these articles about the CIA and the SNLs that were explosive, investigative reporting, and they just weren't picked up by the national uh, media. What did this lead you to conclude towards the press in the United States? Well, did this change your attitude anyway? Well, I mean, uh, some of the press picked up the stories, um, but the, the television networks and the big three, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, never did anything. And I personally think the reason they didn't was because it wasn't their story. 
okay, and they like to do their own investigative work, and they were very far behind. It would have been impossible for them to do the work it would take to do these stories in a, in a, in a manner that would, you know, that would be a good job. And these, these institutions had not even done the SNL stories right. right. I mean, they had ignored, basically ignored them, done a little bit, but it was all the, they were just recycling uh, the work that had basically been done by the Dallas Morning News and Byron Harris and WFAA in Dallas, which was to write about all the Wheeler Dealer, Don Dixon, Ed McBurney types. And that began to be sort of the pattern of investigative reporting. If you did investigative reporting on SNLs, you wrote about all the wild and crazy guys down in Texas that were looting this, these SNLs, and you didn't do what you should have done, which was follow the money. I mean, that's the big advice, you know, Deep Throat gave Bob Woodward in Watergate. Follow the money, that's where the, that's where the story is. Well, that's where the story is in the SNLs, but the reporters did not do that. It was right about the front man and the wild and crazy guys. So these institutions did not do a very good job on the SNLs. So they didn't have the foundation to do either the mafia or the CIA involvement. So, you know, if, if you don't do something, they're, they're the kind of, of, of institutions and people that just ignore it, you know. It's not our story, it's not worth doing. We're just going to ignore it, you know. If we didn't do it, it must not be worth anything. So that, that's exactly what happened. Now, what about uh, Congress? When you first made these revelations that the CIA was involved in robbing the CIA of the savings and loan and using the money to help support the Contras and other illegal off-the-book operations, Congress made some noise that they were going to do some investigation. What came out of this? Well, uh, actually, the, uh, the House Permanent Subcommittee uh, on Intelligence which uh, has oversight of the CIA, uh, did a, a preliminary investigation by their staff and eventually came up and said there's nothing to this. Uh, but it's interest there are several interesting points to note. Number one, uh, they never did what they should have done, which was track any of the money. They relied on the CIA for all their information and um, even the CIA admitted that of the, like the 20 institutions we named, uh, that they had dealt with uh, four of them and that they had dealt with five of the individuals we had named, but they had done nothing wrong. And the thing is that the staff director of the House Intelligence Committee, who was overseeing the investigation, a guy named Dan Childs, had come from the, he was the, the chief financial officer of the CIA and had been brought over to the intelligence uh, subcommittee right before my stories came out and the CIA of course was aware I mean I had ta been talking to them for months so they knew that my stories were going to break soon. Dan Childs also had been brought in 10 years earlier in the Senate uh, Intelligence uh, Committee that had been doing the church investigation that was exposing all the illegal domestic activities of the CIA Childs had been brought in for damage control. It certainly looked like he was being brought in for damage control. And in fact, after they released their report saying there was nothing to this, Childs went back to the CIA. Now he's the executive assistant to the CIA director. This is shameless. It's like uh, this guy Polgar, who was put in charge of investigating Iran Contra, who was another lifetime CIA operative station chief of about six different places, as you point out in your uh, book. So basically, yeah. Congress didn't do anything. No. They covered it up. The press really didn't do anything. And now the Clinton administration faces as much as a $500 billion price tag for the CIA uh, scandal. So what can the government finally do about this? Congress and the Justice Department can track the money. That's all they have to do, and if there was fraud involved, they can get it back. And they haven't done this. I mean, everybody's acting like it's a foregone conclusion that we've lost $500 billion. You know, okay, taxpayers, take the hit and go on. It's not true. The Justice Department is very capable of tracking this money. They can track drug money that starts out as cash in the United States, goes offshore and comes back. Surely they can track SNL money that's always a paper or wire transfer. It's easy to track if, if you got subpoena power. Congress could do it, but they're not doing it. And I don't know whether Clinton is going to make the Justice Department do this or not.
you know, where it's going to be interesting to see who the new attorney general is going to be and whether they're going to go out. I mean, I don't see any indication on Clinton's part that he has any interest in, in, in kicking this sleeping dog. And I think he just wants to let it lie and uh, not mess with it because his party is just as involved as the, as the Republicans. And uh, so I don't see, uh, there's going to have to take, just be mass revolt by the American people, and the American people don't have the information. So what is the responsibility of the uh, press and the citizens to do something about this SNL scandal? Well, I mean, the press has got to do the reporting and the citizens have to do the complaining. You're watching Alternative Views. We turn now to some news stories from the Alternative Press. World Press Review has some uh, stories, some opinions of various newspapers are around the world. Uh, most of the quotes are, uh, oh, not all that significant, but there are a couple of them that I thought you might be interested in. One from a Munich Independent newspaper says it's difficult to discern a program or policy in the new president's uh, persona. He succeeded in pleasing everyone and antagonizing no one, and it was a very perfect marketing strategy. So their conclusion was that Clinton was not elected, Bush was summarily fired. And in Tehran, they said that our experience with the USA during the past half century has left us with no illusions about either Republicans or Democrats. A desire for hegemony is so deep-rooted in the psyche of the American political establishment that the new president, even though he's a Democrat, has no choice but to tread the path of norm in traditional USA foreign policy. One of Bill Clinton's chief campaign pledges was to limit the influence of lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Well, the New York Times News Service reports that his transition team has extensive industry and ties and ties to foreign countries. For instance, Vernon Jordan, the transition chairman, earns at least $442,000 a year from, in fees from sitting on the boards of 11 corporate giants, including Union Carbide, American Express, Xerox, and the debt-laden RJR Nabisco. Jordan also holds almost a million dollars worth of stock in these companies. And his law firm, Aiken, Gump, Hauer, and Feld, represents at least seven of these corporations as well, and as a senior partner, he shares in the law firm's part, uh, profits. The transition director, working right under Jordan, Warren Christopher, is the senior partner in one of the nation's largest law firms, O'Melveny and Myers, whose clients include Mitsui, Sumitomo Trust and Banking, Japan Airlines, and Hyundai. And during the campaign, Clinton made a point of criticizing lobbyists who work for foreign interests, but the Japanese interests, at least, are well represented in his uh, transition team. As well, Christopher earned at least $73,000 last year from sitting on the boards of Lockheed Corporation and Southern California Edison, and his firm also represents both corporations. So you can imagine what sort of feelings this person's going to have about regulating utilities and also military cutbacks. Also, uh, Mickey Cantor, another board member on the transition team, is a member of Manet Phelps, Phillips and Cantor, which has done, works for the government, done work for the governments of Cyprus and Jamaica, and for a wide array of for-profit healthcare corporations, real estate, and transportation firms. He also does lobbying for Japan's NEC Corporation, the cable television industry, and a number of big oil companies. He also uh, on the side, conducted a policy brief briefing for a number of his clients and potential clients, including General Electric. Uh, Samuel Berger, another member, the transition team's foreign policy director, also has for years presided over an international trade firm, uh, the international trade practice at Hogan and Hartson, a law firm whose clients have included Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Bahamas, Ontario, Japan again, and the trading arm of China as well as the Toshiba Corporation of J Japan. And when Toshiba got in trouble with the U.S. government for exporting uh, sensitive technology to the, Soviet the former Soviet Union, Berger was there in Washington helping to defend Toshiba's interests. As Ralph Nader, Nader put it, Cesar Chavez isn't getting any calls, and there have been widespread complaints from the coalition that elected Clinton, which includes uh, many civil rights leaders, uh, people working for migrant farmers, 
people working for other minority rights, that people from these uh, institutions just haven't been called upon. Clinton's gone for the traditional lobbyists and lawyers who have always been sitting inside the beltway dictating what's done to the congressman. I think it's very significant that, what was that, from the New York Times, Washington Post? New York Times News Service. Uh -huh. Right. See, they're not going to point out other connections and interconnections uh, with Clinton and the staff that he's putting together. Uh, for instance, um, I look at the sociology of leadership. What organizations do these people come from? And who are the other people uh, that they associate with? Well, Bill Clinton was a member of the Bilderberger that secret organization, as well as the Council on Foreign Relations. Vernon Jordan is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Warren Christopher is a member of all three of those elite organizations. Uh, Henry, little Henry Cisneros is a member of the CFR. And of course, Lloyd Benson, uh, the, who they say are gonna be our new uh, Secretary of Treasury, he has uh, attended Bilderberg meetings uh, recently as well. So the people that Clinton has in his uh, transition team are people from this very small group of elite organizations. And very few people are members of these organizations. Council on Foreign Relations only has about 15 to 1,700. But the number of people in government from these organizations is huge compared to their size. So we're seeing the same type of thing that we did before in the, um, in actually in the in the Bush and Reagan years. They came from these organizations. Well, the Carter people too. And the Carter. So it's just basically Carter, um, Carter re revisited. Except Clinton is more conservative than Carter, and Clinton came from the. Uh, the uh, Democratic Leadership Council, which was a rebellion against uh, the liberal hegemony of the Democrats. And I saw a statistic where it said that the uh, Congress people, who also are the, uh, support the Democratic Leadership Council, they voted with the Reagan-Bush years. They voted for Reagan and Bush 80 to 90 percent of the time. So it's questionable as how much change Bill Clinton wants or how much he can achieve, even if he wants it. So this, I think, is a major indication that, at least when it comes to economics, it's going to be uh, business as usual with the Clinton administration. My guess is that Clinton's going to continue the conservative policies of the previous decade in the area of economics and foreign policy, and he'll have a much more liberal agenda on social issues. World Press Review has a couple of articles about the mafia, which are really quite disturbing. It says that the mafia like the rest of the economy in the 80s, has gone global, global and has forged alliances wherever it's needed to, killed wherever it's needed to, and is sponsoring indigenous crime syndicates under its control in a lot of countries where they weren't operating before, particularly, uh, say, in Eastern Europe. It has uh, managed to uh, come to grips and work out relationships with the Turkish heroin bosses, the <coughs> Colombia drug cartels. So internationally, it's, sp it's stronger than it ever has been. And even, you know, you hear references here and there to the Russian mafia taking over so much of what is happening in the chaos in, um, in Russia right now. Well, that mafia is actually connected with the uh, Italian Sicilian mafia. Things have changed a bit, though, in that the Mafia still kills in Italy. They've seen that. However, they've kind of gone along with the Colombian style of killing now. They use, instead of just uh, very clean assassinations with uh, rifles or so, there so were submachine guns. They're doing it now with car bombs, which actually kill some, uh, a lot of civilians as well. As an indication of the strength and internationalization of the Mafia. On St. Valentine's Day, appropriately enough, in 1989, there was a meeting in Nice of members of the International uh, Consortium of uh, Illegals. The Sicilian Mafia, which is the octopus, the giant Mafia, uh, they also, uh, with representatives of the Colombian and Venezuelan cartels,
Well, they all got together so that they could divide up the world's spoils, uh, so that they wouldn't have competition with each other, they wouldn't be trampling on each other, or, or they wouldn't have to be killing each other. Cartelization of uh, crime around the world. And what's happening in Italy? There have been some uh, well-publicized assassinations uh, recently, and the people have uh, had a lot of outcry against uh, the uh, Mafia. But this has been going on for some time. Uh, there will be assassinations, the people come up in arms, there will be investigations, and the government say, well, we're going to do something about it, but then nothing ever gets done. It's business as usual. And that is because, according to the World Press Review articles, the establishment in Italy is right in bed and has a very cozy working relationship with the Mafia, and so they're not doing anything about it. So they're becoming stronger and stronger all around the world. It's ironic, this parallel development with international capital and the Mafia keeps lockstep right along with it. Well, according to the New York Times, a rising cost of modernity is depression. If the 20th century ushered in the age of anxiety, its exit, according to the Times, is witnessing the dawn of the age of melancholy. The first international study of major depression reveals a steady rise in the disorder worldwide. The nations as diverse as the United States, Taiwan, Lebanon, and New Zealand, in these countries in each generation, the possibility of getting serious depression, not just sadness, but a paralyzing listlessness, dejection, self-depreciation, and overwhelming sense of hopelessness that these days, it's three times likelier that you're going to get this depression, it's going to set in, than your grandparents. There's been a lot of speculation of why melancholy is on the rise. Some speculate that loss in a belief of God takes away a buffer against <laughs> life's uh, setbacks. Others say the distress created in women by the spread of unattainable ideals of female beauty is a cause, whereas others say that it's physiological, that it has to do more with exposure to toxic substances. And there's been a big debate over why younger Americans also in uh, recent years have had a much, much higher um, case of uh, melancholy than the uh, former uh, generation. Recent studies in journals in the United States indicate that there's a, a much, much higher proportion of people that are getting, getting melancholy these days, and it's become a modern epidemic. I have a couple of short articles here on Poland, one from the World Press Review of, let's see, where does it have? December 1992, and the other from Dollars and Cents, uh, where's that from? De also December 1992. The uh, World Press Review says that the Polish government foresees five more years of recession before things start uh, becoming a little bit better for the people in Poland. And it seems that even that five years taking of that long was a compromise between the reformists and the uh, people who uh, want to go a little bit slower and ease the pain. But according to dollars and cents, it's ironic that the people who are supposedly uh, foisting this on the people, all this pain, are the people who actually used to come from the labor ranks. Remember, Lech Walesa was the leader of the Labor Union Solidarity. Now, the, uh, in the summer of 92, group of unions that had spearheaded Solidarity are now going out on wildcat strikes against Solidarity and the uh, Walesa, Walesa leadership. But there's a very interesting quote by the Prime Minister, who, uh, when some the workers started striking, she sent out uh, dismissal notices to them. They just kick them out, and so the leaders of the strike immediately scaled back their wage demands. Well, the woman who was the Prime Minister uh, came from a satellite party of the Communists originally, back in 1984, and she was expelled from the party for voting against taking away Solidarity's legal status. But she's changed her mind now. Here's what she says about the workers. For 40 years, the workers were treated as the most important class on which the whole system of the state stood. <laughs> 
And it's very bitter for them to understand that the new conditions require them to step down to a very low status. And that brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to extend our thanks to a lot of people who helped make the program possible, particularly Pete Bruton, who wrote the incredible book, The Mafia, the CIA, and George Bush. Our crew for the interview consisted of Brian Lynch, Ashley Blake, Mary McDonald, and Dina Craven. For our news section, Eric Eubank was on camera. Kevin L. West did the audio. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas.